Good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining or in building wireless uh, technology. by uh, BOM of King County in Seattle. Um, first of all, let me go over some of the um, items that um, for the participants on your right hand side, we have a handout material in PDF format. You guys can download it and view it later. And also as, as a participants for this uh, online training course, all the BOMA principal members will receive three clock hours and it was approved by uh, your Department of Licensing. And uh, BOMA, uh, we would like to thank uh, BOMA of King County in Seattle. They were uh, instrumental in uh, getting approve, approved for this. So uh, let's get started. Um, we're gonna talk about in-building wireless technology today. I'm gonna start out with basics. Then I'm gonna be joined by my colleague, Gary Spidelier later, who is a public safety expert. So uh, let's go over our agenda. Here are some of the topics that we're gonna cover during our training. Uh, first of all, we would like to make this uh, online course as interactive as possible. So please use the chat box um, in your uh, panel and uh, feel free to ask me questions during the presentation. So just uh, to set the expectations, the uh, basic training will go about 30, 40 minutes. Then it will be, we'll talk about public safety communication portion, which will go uh, another hour or so. So again, uh, we would like to make it as interactive, as classroom friendly as possible. So please participate and ask questions uh, during the presentation. Again, here are some of the topics we're gonna cover. Um, we're gonna talk about how, um, in building wireless technology works, what's involved, what's macro network, cell on wheels, small pico and femto cells. We're gonna try to define what BDA is. Also, uh, we're gonna dive into the uh, specifics of in building wireless technology. We're gonna try to define what DAS is, what's, what DAS stands for, the type of equipment and how it's structured. And uh, eventually we're gonna get into a public safety portion of it. So um, let's talk about how cellular technology evolved over the years. Um, there was a company called Ameritech based in Chicago, which was credited uh, for deploying the first wireless infrastructure, commercial wireless cellular infrastructure in our country. And what they deployed back in 1980s was known as 1G. G stands for generation and this network was built on, on analog technology. In other words, if you were back in 1980 using a cell phone, uh, you could do only one thing and one thing only. And that was um, using, making phone calls. Uh, the best representation of this era will be your uh, brick phones, right? One of those big Motorola Dynatech phones. So the technology evolved into 2G, which is a second generation. These were deployed by wireless carriers in 1990s. And on this uh, on a 2G network, you can see some glimpses of what digital technology is possible. You, you started seeing functions like SMS and caller ID, voicemail and three-way or conference calling. So in, 19, uh, in 2000s, the wireless carriers started deploying the 3G network. This was dubbed as a true digital wireless network. On this network, the handsets get very complicated and the technology evolved, more bandwidth got pushed around. So the sub functions such as music streaming, web surfing was much faster and video conferencing was possible. And sometimes if you have enough bandwidth, good connection, some people can use to download full motion videos. At this current time, we have a cellular technology called fourth generation, otherwise known as LTE. LTE stands for long-term evolution. This is dubbed as a true high-speed network. This is what we everybody has in our country now. This, on this network, people can do things like video on demand. The voice quality is much better. It's an HD audio. Kids can do gaming, streaming. In some instances, 
3D uh, videos even possible on this network. And eventually what we're heading to is a 5G network, and we'll talk about that later. So before we get into the specifics, uh, this chart illustrates the demand on wireless infrastructure, right? So we talked about 1G being deployed by Ameritech back in 1980s. So at that time when the cellular uh, technology was in infancy, we had about roughly 300,000 wireless subscribers in this country. So that number grown over the years, currently the US wireless subscribers exceed 300 million plus. A lot of us have a multiple wireless devices that are connected. So the, in other words, the penetration is exceeded 100%. So what does, it, what does it do? So it puts enormous strain on the wireless carriers infrastructure. It creates, when everybody's connected with their wireless devices, it creates a, what we call a growing pain on the wireless uh, carriers network infrastructure. So in form of congestion, capacity, and the technology is shifting all the time as well. So this is slide, we're gonna talk about very basics, where it, where it comes from. So every one of us now carries this device known as cell phone. And the actual hardware itself gets a lot of attention. We talk about, oh, what kind of device we have, like oh, somebody has Samsung device, somebody has an Apple device, then we get into Samsung Galaxy Note, you know, Apple 9, 10, for example. So what I'm trying to say is the hardware itself gets a lot of attention. We all know it's a very powerful device and computer itself too. And on top of that, the application we run on devices gets a lot of attention, right? The type of apps we run, that's always we talk about to each other. But the part that we neglect is that these cell phone devices are radio devices itself. All those Facebook photos, that we uploading or viewing are transmitting in forms of zeros and ones in digital form. And there's a chipset inside our, our phones that converts those devices into radio frequencies. So the cell phone itself is also uh, has to be understood as a radio devices. So once it's a radio device, then the question comes how it communicates with its signal source. Now it uses a thing called radio frequency, RF, right? So the RF is a very interesting phenomenon, uh, physical phenomenon, because as humans, we immune to it. Our senses cannot detect it. We cannot smell, see, touch the RF frequencies. But if you talk to any RF engineer, they will swear up and down this thing is exist. So the when, <clears throat> since cell phones are radio devices, um, the RF frequency itself, using RF frequency to modulate data, and that's how it gets connected to the its signal source. So the frequency itself travels uh, in a different rate. Uh, the RF frequency is defined by how many times the RF wave cycles per second. So if somebody says 20 hertz, that means RF frequency is cycling 20 times per second. And if somebody says 800 megahertz, that means that RF frequency is cycling 800 million times per second. So when it gets to gigahertz rate, it's going to be in billions. So what does that matter? The, the basics is that higher the frequency, the more bandwidth it pushes through. So the higher frequency, also the RF signal itself gets less resilient. Uh, in today's world, in a commercial uh, cellular technology, the most carriers use the frequencies between about 700 megahertz and 2.5 gigahertz. Just note that and note that in your uh, uh, back of your head. So as RF frequency travels through the airwaves, it behaves in different ways. So for example, when, um, Let's imagine cell towers. When cell towers emitting high frequency, high power RF, when it hits the building, sometimes it scatters. So in, uh, when it hits certain surfaces, it scatters. Then sometimes it gets reflected. Sometimes it diffracts, it goes around the object. And sometimes it refracts, meaning some signal goes through the building, some doesn't. 
sometimes it gets absorbed by different material. Why does it matter? It's because at the end of the day, all the RF engineer's job is to try to define and shape these RF signals in certain ways so the RF signal gets propagated properly in certain areas so everybody gets the coverage and everybody's happy. <clears throat> so we're going to talk about the basics of wireless infrastructure here. I want to get I want to get a question and just going to run some pop quiz here. Does anybody know how the wireless carriers transmit their signal to cell towers? We all know the most visible portion is a cell tower, right? The wireless infrastructure. How does the signal get to the cell tower? I'm going to take a pause and just wait for a question here. Or guess. Okay, there is one. So yes, uh, the fiber, right? The fiber backhaul. So the, in old days, what our wireless carriers did was they used a thing called microwave links. So in other words, all the all cell towers were linked in a daisy chain manner. So one cell tower will be talking to the next tower and the next and the next, et cetera. But the, the downfall is that is out, as the RF propagates through the airwaves, it loses power and it loses bandwidth. As bandwidth intensive applications get more prevalent, it wasn't adequate enough. So nowadays, most of these cell towers we see in the streets is connected with known as a uh, fiber backhaul. This fiber backhaul is connected to the carrier central office. And uh, that's how the wireless carriers distribute the signal. Okay, I'm gonna go to the next slide. So look at the venue like this. This is appears to be a Dallas Cowboys stadium. The capacity is about 60 to 70,000 people any given Sunday, right? So <clears throat> imagine all these people at one place at one time. And these people have, every one of them, I bet you have the cell phone devices on. So even if they're not using it, they sell the cell phone devices are still connected to its signal source. So if you're not taking photo, making phone call, text messages, that cell phone is still pinging its signal source which creates capacity and coverage shortage. So in order to solve that, the wireless uh, carriers deploy a lot of different solutions. One of them is obviously they can expand the existing network of cell towers. They can put up more cell towers. And that's much easier said than done because putting up a cell tower is very difficult venture in our country. The attitude toward cell towers in uh, neighborhoods around the country is not in our backyard. It's an eyesore, and some people believe there's health, health implications with that as well. Then another solution the wireless carriers deploy is temporary solutions like cell on wheels. Imagine an outdoor concert or parade. If the wireless carriers know there's a large amount of people going to congregate in a certain areas ahead of time, what they do is they deploy these temporary uh, solutions that are kind of like miniature cell tower on the, on, the, on the wheels. They deploy it and they provide coverage and capacity, then they move it afterwards. Again, it's a temporary solution. Now we're starting to get into an indoor type of solution, which is a BDAs and repeaters. BDA stands for bidirectional amplifier. These are kind of over the air kind of devices. You imagine if you're in a tall building, you would have placed an antenna on the roof and bring signal indoors and that BDA would re-amplify the signal and uh, distribute it throughout the building. Then you have a, some sort of IP type of solutions like uh, femto cells and uh, um, <coughs> pico cells, right? And um, femto cell is basically, uh, again, digital repeater. If you were a customer with one of the four main carriers, if you live in an area that doesn't have an adequate coverage, you would call your carrier up and says, hey, I'm having a, a hard time receiving signal in my area, they would send you a little digital box where you can plug into your internet and provide some limited capacity coverage. Then we will have a solution called distributor antenna system, which stands for DAS. 
let me move to the next slide. So here on this slide, we're gonna try to define what uh, distributed antenna system is. This is basic, distributed antenna system is basically a system designed to provide coverage and capacity in any given area. So the form of DAS existed since 1980s. The early primitive ways to distribute signal was through the thing called leaky cables. It's more of a capacity driven solution. And uh, uh, it's driven by the growth of the carrier technology change from 3G to 4G. So when we talk about DAS, all these in building solutions, we're talking about pretty significant size venues. We're talking about college campuses, healthcare, hospital campuses, you know, airports, stadiums, things like that. But there is a second, second top tier buildings like office building and so on, which also needs this type of solution. So on this slide, I'm gonna explain the basic in how the in-building wireless is structured, right? Where the signal source comes from, the basics of the equipment, and some of the passive components that goes with it. <clears throat> this illustration shows the carrier central office, which could be anybody, Verizon, T-Mobile, uh, AT&T, or Sprint. So the fiber backhaul that we uh, earlier talked about is connected to the carrier central office. So instead of the fiber, going to the cell towers, it goes directly inside the building. And carriers would place equipment called base station inside the building, and that base station pumps high amounts of RF power, it gets attenuated and connected to a certain equipment called pass equipment. So that takes that signal, converts it into optical signal, and distributes throughout the building. This is how modern uh, in-building wireless technology works in, in, this, in the most basic sense. Then you have uh, some of the passive solutions like involving BDA, right? And <clears throat> on this example, medium or small size building would have a typical antenna placed on the roof, pointing toward the signal source, which is a cell tower, and bring that signal indoors. And the BDA itself reamplifies that signal and transmits throughout the building. Again, that was the portion of the basics of the wireless technology. At this point, I'm gonna transfer the control to my colleague, Gary, and he's gonna cover the public safety portion of our presentation. So thank you, Sayola, I appreciate that. Um, and if, if Sayola hasn't got you totally confused, I will attempt to uh, finish the job. Um, I've been involved in public safety since about 1973, so for many, many years. And what we're gonna do is try and get you uh, an overall flavor of, of in-building systems for public safety and how it applies to commercial real estate. Wendy's gonna be helping me on this as I go through this. The other thing is that we have uh, questions that you can send on the on the chat line. We will answer those questions uh, as they come up. So don't be afraid to ask. And one of them is just showing up now. Um, before I get started, somebody asked a question about how do you select a BDA versus DAS for in building. In actual fact, a bi-directional amplifier is the source for the distribution system. A bi-directional amplifier can be used on its own in a passive DAS with RF cable, as Sayola just talked about, but we can also use a BDA to feed a DAS system. And in public safety systems, by and large, what we see is BDAs are used to feed most of the systems. The reason being is that Public safety systems have to be secure. One of the controls that you have is the operator, whether it's the police or the fire department or the emergency services uh, department in any area, will control the base station, the signal, how it operates and provide security for it. And for in-building coverage, in most cases, we'll use a bi-directional amplifier 
to pick up that signal from that system and make sure that it gets from the outside to the inside without in any way affecting the security of the primary system. So right. the answer if to the may, question yeah. is... Gary, Go ahead, also, also the BDAs are used mostly a single carrier and a smaller venue type of solutions. So if you have a very large size venue, and if you want to have a comprehensive coverage that involves all four carriers, as well as a public safety communication, then you would use DAS in those instances. Correct. The larger the system is, the more likely to use DAS. Um, when I said you're more likely to use a BDA specifically for public safety, and it's related to security. And that doesn't mean that you only use that. Uh, we are involved in a, a very large system for one of the major airports now, and there's coverage outside of the airport uh, on the tarmac and the surrounding areas. There's also coverage inside the terminals themselves, and the, the coverage inside the terminals is actually provided by a completely separate base station system to give you the capacity you need. So um, it, it, it really, it depends on the situation, but for smaller, commercial buildings, you're more likely to be using a BDA picking up the public safety system off air. The situation with commercial is almost exactly the opposite, where you're likely to be using a base station to, to feed the DAS system. So that the, the two of them are, they have slightly different requirements, and we will elaborate though on those a little more as we go along. Okay, Wendy, do you want to go to the first slide? Um, cellular and public safety are different. We have to have strong commercial cellular indoor coverage because consumers expect it now. If, if you're in a place that doesn't have coverage, we all get upset. And those consumers are the ones who are going to dial 911 to report an emergency via their cell phone. Uh, we all see what's happening in the news now where incidences are reported being with a cell phone, where literally video is being taken with a cell phone. So that, that strong commercial network within the building is the primary key to initiate a 911 call. And I, I, again, we have to remember that we're not talking in two systems in isolation. Sayola said this in, in many different ways when he was talking about it, that commercial and public safety work hand in hand. Once first responders are on the scene, public safety in building coverage allows firefighters, law enforcement officers, any others to communicate with each other. And this is really important because the public safety system is not part of the public wireless cellular communication system. It's completely separate and it's completely separate for good reason. And we'll elaborate that on that a little more as we go through this. But 911 calls are placed by a commercial system. First responders have their own private system, and quite often the police, the fire, the emergency service will all have their own unique system. That's the situation as it exists today. Wendy? You don't have to read these. You can download the, 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 you know, the presentations and go three, through these. The important thing here is failures in public safety radio communications are widespread. Uh, the Washington Post article talks about uh, communications in a metro tunnel, and literally, that's not a building, but it's the same situation. The tunnel isolates you from the signals on the outdoor network, and so you have to have a separate system, usually a DAS system, providing coverage both at the underground stations and in the tunnels as well. The 9-11 article there is, it's important because what they talk about is what happens in a true emergency. And I've been involved in this for many years. I can give you some specific examples where uh, when I was as working as a consultant in Toronto, Quite often, if there was a fatality in an apartment building fire or a commercial building, 
uh, I would get called in to do an evaluation of the communication systems. And it, it saddened the way, but almost every case, the result was exactly the same. If the responders, the fire department, the emergency services crew had had better communications, there would have been less or no loss of life. So this is a very, very serious issue. And then the other thing that comes from this is that, uh, and Sayola reminded me of this, a 911 call is very rarely, you know, very calmly made where somebody explains what's happening and what needs to happen. If you're facing uh, an emergency, whether it's a shooting incident or a fire or whatever, you tend to get a lot of calls. A lot of them are very hard to understand. And I was actually, again, I was called in as an independent observer just to evaluate what exactly was said on the call and how people responded to it. So again, that 9-11 call is important to kick it off, but it's mass confusion. And what we're trying to do with the public safety system, with the unique public safety system, is make absolutely sure that we give the best possible prioritized communications to the public safety, the first responders who are on the scene right. and have to find out what's going on and how to respond. Right, Gary, so if I may add here, uh, the wireless carriers looked at the network and didn't study. And what they found out was that 80% of the all calls uh, the made by their subscribers were either initiated or ended in, inside the building. That's why the wireless industry making this big outreach to the commercial real estate folks, members of BOMA, and trying to educate them in the basics of in building wireless technology. So they know they play a very important role in providing a coverage uh, for uh, in building wireless. So uh, the tenants, everybody um, is inside the building, have a, um, uh, have a, a reasonable and good connection when it comes to the cellular um, network, right? Seola, absolutely. And, and just, you know, to expand on that, um, uh, we do a lot of work with commercial systems as well as public safety systems and we are seeing more and more high-end buildings where as part of their uh, initiative to attract tenants to the building they are providing a a very high-end solution for cellular for commercial coverage so that when you walk into that building you don't drop a call that you are still getting a a call that is same quality as you would outdoors, and it's something we work on as well. And very right. important that we all expect, right? We all expect when you go indoors, you still get wireless coverage. Uh, right. I, yeah, uh, I can remember year, years ago when we, we, we didn't have, you'd walk into an elevator and you'd lose the call automatically. Well, these days that doesn't really happen that often because again, the in-building coverage has led you to expect to be able to carry on that conversation. Right. So uh, we have a question also uh, online that says, with the Wi-Fi calling available, what's the benefit to carrier-specific paths versus uh, distributed Wi-Fi? So I'm going to at least attempt to answer this question. There's a big debate in our industry about this. Uh, yes, Wi-Fi is a good solution, and a lot of the carriers enabled Wi-Fi calling on the handsets to make a, um, a phone call. But there is a technical hurdle behind the scene that they don't talk about, which is the handoff. Handoff. Is, is a terminology, for example, if you're driving on a highway um, at certain speed, your cell phone is pinging one tower after another as you travel, right? So when you connect it to the Wi-Fi network, that handoff, for example, if you're walking inside the building, very large venue, the handoff from one AP to next AP. Now, if you walk outside the building, for example, if you wanna, that handoff part has not technically been seamless. So that means um, users are experiencing a lot of dropped calls, and that's one of the major downfalls of the Wi-Fi calling. And sometimes the quality is not very adequate as a network, um, as a cellular network. And there's some security implications with that as well, because the, as far as the security goes, the wireless and cellular network is much more secure than the Wi-Fi network. Just, uh, just to briefly answer that question. 
we can move on. Now. Yeah, Sayola. Yeah, Sayola. Just just to go on from that because this comes up all the time. The advantage of Wi-Fi or a distributed Wi-Fi system is that almost universally it will be cheaper. Okay. The disadvantage is that there is absolutely no way that today's Wi-Fi can keep up with the quality you're getting on a commercial network, whether it's new first net or whether it's it's the commercial networks. Um, I have a very high quality wireless connection into my home and I consistently get 50 megabits per second on Wi-Fi. If I don't get at least 100 on my wireless connection, on my commercial wireless connection using LTE, I'm disappointed. My LTE signal will operate over a considerably wider distance than uh, Wi-Fi access points. And then the other thing is a Wi-Fi access point has a limited amount of bandwidth that you share. So if you're the only one that's using it, that's fine. If you're within 50 feet at the Wi-Fi access point, that's fine. The minute none of those things are true, then you start to see degradation in Wi-Fi. And certainly the people I work with know that I will quite often, when somebody's on a Wi-Fi call on a conference call, is ask them to uh, drop and call back in on a commercial line because Wi-Fi is not the same quality as commercial. And it's not to denigrate Wi-Fi. Wi-Fi is great. It provides a low-cost solution. It's something everybody can use. I make use of it myself. But for what we're talking about for major public buildings or certainly for public safety, it's a second choice. Now, having said that, this, the company that I work for, the system they have, allows you to integrate Wi-Fi with your commercial coverage. So you're actually giving your customers the choice of what they want to use. But it is still, it, it's really a sort of second tier in terms of quality and it has its place, but it is not as good as commercial grade uh, wireless systems, nor is it as good as, as, as public safety first responder systems. So I hope that answers that question, but it was a very, very good question. We get asked this all the time. Wendy? So public safety in building coverage. What we're seeing now is more and more uh, municipalities are passing ordinances requiring in building public safety for first responders. Some municipalities will not issue an occupancy permit to a new building without public safety coverage, literally. Unless you can verify that you have public safety coverage in the building, you don't get an occupancy permit. And, and we've seen this ourselves where uh, a, major, a, a major new building was ready to open it to the public and they were delayed by a couple of weeks because the fire department said we didn't have any coverage in the building. So we uh, put in a system there relatively quickly that provided the required coverage, which allowed that building to open up and become a, a commercially viable operation. Secondly, what we see is more and more first responders need to be able to communicate with each other. And I mentioned earlier that quite often you, you've seen the police department, the fire department, the ambulance service, every emergency service you can mention will have their own system. And some of them work with each other, some of them don't. And again, that's not a negative comment. When we used to have channelized systems, you would get license for those individual channels and everybody was very careful to make sure they made maximum use of their channels so that they could keep them, so that the FCC license remained intact, and over the years, they've gotten used to this of sort of protecting what was for them a very valuable asset. But it's, you know, unfortunately 9-11 proved uh, 
it really is important that all of the agencies communicate with each other. We're seeing first responder technology evolving from voice only to voice and data. And again, uh, if you look outdoors now, if you look in, uh, in any uh, uh, police vehicle, sitting up front is a computer. And so that data is as equally as important as the voice. And when we get to FirstNet and talk about it, we'll explain what's happening with that. But you can use that data for all kinds of things. And one of the examples that I always use is if you've got a fire department and, and it's looking at a, you know, barrels filled with chemicals, they can literally take a, a photograph, a picture, and wirelessly transmit that back to their dispatch center to determine if there is a safety risk, if they've got to evacuate a building, if there's a risk to the, the first responders themselves. So that's, that's part of what we're doing. We're evolving this to a next generation that is just giving the first responders more tools. We have to have mission critical communications all the time. I mentioned that when I talked about, you know, looking at, at fires in, in, in apartment buildings. If, if a first responder is going into an incident, they want to be able to continue their communication no matter what the situation is. We want to support all local agencies, um, multi-band, multi-technology solutions. Again, something Sayola mentioned on the commercial side where we see lots of different operators all the major carriers in any major building. If you go into a, a football stadium, you certainly expect every, every major commercial carrier to be there. By the same token, we really have to provide for all of the local first responders to be able to communicate within that, that structure or that stadium, whatever it is. And then lastly, what we're seeing is NFPA, which is a National Fire Protection Association, or IFC, the International Fire Code, systems have to be compliant. And both of those agencies basically publish a list of requirements that you have to design to to make sure that the public safety system you install meets those requirements. And typically, uh, particularly in, in the case of fire, your local fire department will be testing that system on an annual basis just to make sure that it works the way it's supposed to, that you're getting the coverage you're supposed to, and more importantly, that the alarms that are associated with NFPA or IFC compliance are being transmitted to the correct location. And usually that's the fire to dispatch position. Wendy? Can you go to the next page? Wendy, can you go to the next page? Yeah, Gary, um, is this on the next page, future requirements? Is that what you see? We see a public safety and building coverage Page. Yeah, that's the one it's I just went prob through. That's probably the uh, slow connection. Yeah, I'm on the public safety. There we go. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Sorry about that. Uh, so, future requirements for public safety migration from narrow band to broadband. And, and what I mean by that is, again, building on what Sayola talked about. Narrow band are channelized systems, okay? Uh, typically used for voice, voice. When we go to broadband systems, LTE is a broadband system. Uh, you know, the example you're using there, is it showing there, is you've got a, uh, somebody from the fire department that is, is taking probably a picture of the temperature of what's going on right there. That can be transmitted right back to the dispatch center on a wideband, a broadband system. We need support for LTE. LTE, long-term evolution, 
with ongoing support of the legacy system, LMR, land, mobile, radio. You know, this is really, really important. Uh, with commercial systems, quite often you put in a new system, turn off the old one, and the new system is operational immediately. When we do a public safety system, the old system gets turned off or the up the 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 obsolete system gets turned off after the new system or the upgraded system has shown that it's meeting its design requirements and it's fully operational so when you've got an existing building where you're upgrading the system because of the nature of of the public safety market we need to make sure that that new system is fully operational before we turn off the older system and it, it's something i can't stress strongly enough if you've got a new building that doesn't come into play but on an older building where there is a system particularly that if, as we see public safety agencies migrate to first net we're going to see that, that that's a real requirement in all existing buildings and then the last thing is is nationwide interoperability. Um, that just literally, it, it means that everyone in the country is on the same system. Everyone in the country is essentially buying the same radios. The radios that they're buying means that you have a much wider market, which hopefully will push down the cost of those individual radios. It means that if you need to share people, if, if we send people in, to California to help fight forest fires from other areas, their radios will work in California just as they did in their home home state. So that nationwide operability is again something that is really, really important. And we'll talk about that a little later too. Future applications. Um, live video streaming. Again, if you're at an incident, be able to film what's going on to take that back to get more people involved in what's going on, to do thermal imaging, to see exactly where hotspots are. Uh, you know, you can have a, a person on site looking through a door to see if there's a fire behind that door before they open it up. And not only that, but communicate that information to everybody else involved in the incident. Real-time location awareness. Being able to use GPS, you know, we all use Google Maps or whatever, we need to have that real-time location awareness as to exactly where you are. And that's something that is, is really important. And it's also a function that is still being developed. So it, it's new, it's not finished yet, we're still developing it. Um, dynamic traffic flow updates. And what that is talking about is the traffic within the, the radio system. So we need to be able to monitor who's using the system, what capacity is needed, make sure that everybody has the communication channels they need. And then lastly, automatic triggering of alarms to alert the command center. Uh, we have basic fire alarms now. We can actually, as we evolve the system, uh, incorporate wireless alarms to go m much further beyond anything we've got now and go back to a command center so that what we're doing is trying to be preventive rather than reactive. And I think that that's really important as well. Wendy? What causes poor in-building coverage? Um, and, you know, relative to the question, we have another question is, is uh, does every building need a, a, a public safety DAS system? Not necessarily, but what we're seeing now is newer buildings, thermally coated windows, leads requirements, which is trying to make the building more eco-friendly, cut down on the cost of actually having the build building operate more efficiently, uh, more profitably if you want, that there's less RF getting in that used to. The building structure, um, concrete metal support structure, metal framing on interior walls, all of this is degrading the, the signal that gets into a building. Staircase, underground parking garage, isolated areas with metal fire doors. We have to make sure 
that they're covered, and typically they aren't. And then the new public safety uh, systems are using higher frequency bands. So as Sayola talked about earlier, we're going up to higher frequencies. Higher frequencies, unfortunately, don't penetrate as well. And so all of this means that we've got two things going on, radio systems that are more complicated, and we've got buildings that are not very radio friendly. In general, most new buildings will not have adequate coverage. They've been designed so that they shield the interior from the outside, and the only way to fix that is to put in a DAS system so that you can get coverage where you need it. And, and that's an almost universal statement, that you get poor in building coverage because of the evolution of both building technologies and the wireless communications technology. Wendy? This is Seattle, this is current requirements, but this is typical of, of you know, literally it's typical of right across the country. Um, you know, you have to provide radio coverage in areas of buildings where signal strength does not meet the minimum criteria. And that minimum criteria is typically determined by the, uh, you know, fire marshals themselves. You can use a BDA, a DAS, whatever it is, uh, you've got to provide adequate signal strength inside the building. In a new building, you have to have an emergency responder system. And buildings that are more than five stories or more than 50,000 square feet, or the total basement area is more than 10,000 square feet, have to have an emergency responder system. And this is, you know, it. it I wish I could tell you that this was standard across the country. It's not quite, but again, almost all of municipalities we see, almost all of the states, everyone is starting to pass rules that incorporate these into the entire process of getting uh, a building, building occupancy permit. And this is February 2016. There's actually some changes that are coming about right now that we'll talk about, but um, Seattle is very much aware of these. What's interesting, as a municipality, their uh, transit system is also very much aware of this. So Seattle is a good example of a, a municipality where they're paying attention to what's happening, what's changing, and what they need to do to basically protect their citizens. Wendy? Mary, we have a question. Yes. Oh, okay. Good question. Thank you. By the way, now you know why Wendy and I are operating together. Um, the uh, the lead requirements causing poor signals. Yeah. What they what they're doing is it's a sealed building envelope, and from a you know I guess an environmental perspective, sealed. They're trying to keep the 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 interior of the building as isolated as possible from the exterior. Unfortunately, a byproduct of that is nearly everything they do to keep the building isolated from an environmental perspective does exactly the same thing from an RF perspective. If you look at windows now, um, my home has, has double pane windows with some kind of gas between them and a film on them, and they're really good at keeping out sun and warmth. They're also really good at keeping out RF. Uh, I drop the signal going in my house from outside to inside by about 20 dB. In a commercial building, that loss is even higher. So that's why the Leeds building is is typically, it's, it's good for the environment, it's not so good for, for RF. And so what we do is we put, just like, with environmental issues, we put, instead of an HVA system to concern with environmental issues, we put in a radio distribution system that provides adequate coverage inside the building, even though it's isolated from, from the exterior. And I hope that answers the question, but it, it is. It, it's basically LEEDS provides a, a very, very good RF isolation as well as environmental isolation. 
Okay. Now, future requirements, Seattle, again, very specific. Um, there's a rebanding effort going on in, in this, uh, involves 800 megahertz systems it's very complicated it goes back to uh, a deal the fcc made with um, uh, sprint seattle has completed all of that okay most of it is completed nationwide so i think that that's really we can consider that a done deal now um, replacing of aging analog infrastructure with p25 digital infrastructure the it, this and this is typical, by the way. You have a uh, an older analog system. So what they're going to do is they're going to put a new system in. The new system will be P25, which is an APCO standard uh, association of police communications officers, um, and that standard is sort of a, uh, a first generation digital standard. It allows for trunking, it allows for slow speed data, but it, it's basically a system that you can into put into place which brings you into the current space, okay? And if you look at the timing on that, 2018, 2020, um, when this is finished, there will be another system in place that the, you know, they'll have to look at as well. The new nationwide network 2018 to 2028 we're going to talk about that first net which is the new nationwide network is absolutely real and what's interesting in this PSERN the uh, they've recognized the need for accommodating first net because it's on a different frequency so what they will have to do is put in BDAs and DAS that not only accommodate the P25 system that they're installing right now, it will also have to accommodate the new 700 megahertz system. So the other key in looking at what's required for your building is both the need for existing coverage and the need for this new FirstNet 700 megahertz coverage. There's a link there to the FirstNet site that's well worth looking at. And again, this is a very good example. They're replacing their system with a new system that's essentially a defined standard, but be that as it may, there's a new standard going into place in with FirstNet, and they'll probably be on the FirstNet system. My take is for systems that are this recently, they will be operating both systems in parallel for at least five years and maybe up to 10 years. But I actually believe that this is, this is what's going to happen. So this is a very, very good example. What does it mean for you? It means that if you've got a building that requires first responder coverage, you're gonna to have to put in something that does P25, the existing standard. You're gonna to have to have put in something that accommodates FirstNet, which is the new national standard. So you're going to have systems that cover at least two bands and maybe more, and it's going to be a requirement. And this is not, the future, the, the timing on this, the 2018 timing to start FirstNet is very, very real. Um, AT&T won the contract to, to build out the FirstNet macro network, and they are due to have, I think, their first systems up and running in first quarter of this year. So this is happening right now. It's coming very, very quickly, and it will change what you need to do. And what it means is that when you're looking at what's required for a new building, if you're looking at an occupancy permit, not only do you need to look at what you need today, but what's likely going to be required shortly, and shortly being probably within a two-year period. 
So you have to keep both those things in mind when you're specifying an in-building public safety system. When they Evolution of public safety communications, and again, I'm mirroring some of what Sayola did, but historically they were channelized, one voice conversation for one radio channel, and that's the way the systems existed. With uh, the APCO P25 phase one, phase two systems, what the public safety agencies tried to do was to better utilize the existing channels and move to a trunking system, largely for macro coverage and the use voting receivers. And I'll explain a little bit about that. When we say trunking, it means that you are sharing the channels among a number of users and probably have fewer channels than you need if everybody was on the system at one time. This works because you never have everybody on the system at one time, in theory. And, and so this is one of the things that we've done. And with voting receivers, what they used to do is you would have, you know, areas of low ground, areas that were shielded by large apartment buildings still outside, but they would put a separate receiver in there to make sure that the public safety officials, first responders that were on the ground outside still had adequate coverage. So that's, they've done that. Uh, in in our you know, well, the system I just talked about is an example. That is, those systems are being built out today. In the future, FirstNet's going to provide a nationwide integrated public safety platform that incorporates high-speed data, video, group calling, emergency prioritization, as well as voice. And my personal belief is that within five to 10 years, we're going to see almost everyone migrate to this system. They may keep their existing systems as backup, but I think the features that are available in FirstNet, which is an LTE system, it's very similar to what you're used to right now with 4G with some additional features related to public safety. And again, as this evolves, I think that you're going to find almost universally all the public safety agencies will migrate to this. It is a macro system right now. The contract that AT&T won to build out this system across the country does not include any requirement for in-building coverage. It will be required. It's going to have to be there, we know that, but they're building a macro network to meet the first net requirements. AT&T is well aware of the fact that there will be additional requirements. And if you look at uh, large stadiums, convention centers, that sort of idea, that discussions about that are already taking place now. If you look at commercial buildings, as first net is deployed, you're going to see a requirement imposed on commercial buildings that they supply first net coverage as well as whatever the older systems are. And again, that little point at the bottom, there's still many very basic systems in place. The market tends to be very conservative and it's for good reasons. There's lives at stake. And it's important to remember that. So when you're working with your local authorities, they're probably going to be looking at the future somewhat skeptically in some cases, but they're going to want to make sure that their system that they're using now is provided in your DAS system. So again, we're evolving. It's going to be a quick evolution, but for the next five to 10 years, we're going to see at least two systems and maybe more operating in parallel. And it just complicates designing and, and provisioning a, a public safety communication system. Okay. In building coverage systems for public safety, you want reliable coverage and access at all times. 
You want coverage during incidents. And this is an interesting comment because this was brought home to me actually by a communication officer for one of the major California cities where I gave him my spiel at a show and he said to me, he said, Gary, that's really wonderful, but who cares? And rather than be insulted, I said, okay, explain your comment. What we've got to do is make sure that we have coverage during whatever the incident is. Fire rated cables and fiber, make sure that the uh, equipment is in proper enclosures. Uh, we can provide a highly reliable system. Redundancy. And again, depending on what I'm doing, if I'm doing an airport, for example, I can design a system with full redundancy. It doubles the cost. You're not going to do that for a commercial system. But what we can do is when we do the RF design, is we can design coverage redundancy. So that if you lose one of the remotes, if you lose one of the DAS nodes, the system continues to operate and provide coverage. It may not be at quite the same level as a, a fully operational system, but it will be adequate for the first responders. So again, a public safety system is designed slightly differently. You need a secure and encrypted transmission of communications. And again, Digital Voice uh, LTE provides that encrypted transmission. You need emergency backup power. If you lose power in a building, what just happened at CES, the Consumer Electronics Show, um, they lost power and all their fancy, you know, technology didn't work very well with no power. You need to have emergency backup power. You need NEMA, which is the National Electrical Manufacturers Association rated enclosures. These ensure that the equipment is an enclosure that will withstand, you know, the normal environment that it will withstand to a certain extent fire so that you, you that's really really important and lastly you need to have a modular system because i've talked about this Sayola's talked about it um, you need to accommodate the past technologies the present technologies and the future technologies and right now past is p25 present is FirstNet lte and future is probably some of the 5G technologies that will be incorporated into FirstNet as they evolve. So those are the sort of requirements on a, a macro level that you need for an in-building coverage system. I'll go through this quickly, but this is this is the, the technical gobbledygook part. Um, passive distributed, di distributed antenna system, you know, um, one of the questions I get asked is, does every building need a, a, a DAS system? No. If you've got adequate coverage uh, in a building from the macro system outside, you don't need a, a DAS system. If you've got a small building, okay, and you can take an off-air repeater and just basically hook up a bunch of antennas to it, that bi-directional amplifier will probably give you adequate coverage. It's a very basic solution, but I'm conscious all the time is that you have to look at the cost uh, involved versus what you're getting. So a properly designed passive system, it has some limitations. It's difficult to scale, but in a smaller building, it may be the best way to go. Okay, the next slide. Active analog task, and we can see here, what we're doing is we're taking either an off-air signal from a radio tower or from a base station, a P25 phase one, phase two base station, and we're feeding that into that head end unit. What that does is it converts that RF signal into an optical signal, and we're literally sending light over fiber, and that goes to a remote unit. This enables us to tailor coverage to the low, the absolutely to the building itself. We can eliminate any dark spots within the building, parking garage or that. The problem is that the signal degrades in both directions. Um, even though it's RF over fiber, there's degradation in the signal. So it, it, it's better, but there's still limitations, okay? 
and the next one. So this is digital. Again, we can take it through off the air or we can directly feed a base station into it. The head end unit, very similar. It converts the signal to fiber, but what it does do, it converts it to digital. So it's a digital signal going over the fiber. Um, this is currently the way all commercial base stations are constructed. It is important because it allows you to uh, basically integrate just about anything you want. Um, th this can support P25, phase one, phase two, transition to LTE first net. It's scalable. We can do a unified deployment if required. It's multi-band because of, of the nature of the system and because of the nature of what we can do in a digital domain we can design this for as much survivability as you need. The most complicated system that I was involved in, I think had five different failures had to occur before the system was, the sixth failure would cause the system to shut down, but they had to occur at the same time. Uh, it's disadvantage is it's less cost effective in smaller buildings, but this is probably the most effective technology solution to providing high quality future proof DAS. Wendy? Public safety versus commercial DAS. And we've got a question here, which I'll answer as part of this. Um, the question was, can the same system hand, handle P25 and LTE. Yes, a digital DAS certainly can. Um, it, you know, the, those systems are different, but if you've got a technology agnostic system, it can handle both of them. The systems are different though, from commercial to public safety. Public safety is coverage. You have to have the coverage everywhere. Number one. It's critical communications. You can't lose it. Depending on the customer situation, there's a regulatory driver, and that could be you know, occupancy permits or whatever, 24-7 availability. As we've evolved, uh, I, start, I actually started doing cellular as well as public safety before First G ever arrived. So I don't know what we call that, but... Uh, I, I sort of worked on systems that were before 1st G. Commercial cellular has developed as, you know, something that we expect to be ubiquitous. We want high capacity. We want speed. We need to be able to generate revenue for the system. And whether that's for the building owner or whether that's for the operator, the system has to generate revenue. Business drivers determine what we do, what we put in, how much capacity, Again, 24-7 availability. So, obvious question, and we get this all the time, can you do everything on one system? The answer is, technically, yes. In a digital system, you can integrate this and do the entire thing on one system. I would never, ever, ever do that. And I'll tell you why. Even though you save money on shared resources, in maintenance, there's a different design criteria. I talked about that earlier in terms of redundancy for public safety. You can design for coverage redundancy. Very easy way to work it. When you design for coverage criteria in a public safety system, what that would mean is over provisioning in a cellular system and too much interference. Concerns about network availability during critical events prioritization. You want to keep everything separate, okay? You don't want the system overloading. So that's why I would keep the two systems separate. And lastly, network security. A public safety system has to be more secure. Uh, it's why you see more BDAs being used as opposed to base stations. So even though it save money, I would still, in all cases, look at two separate systems you can save money by installing them at the same time. 
but the design is different. Next. FirstNet initiative. This is an interesting slide. When we first put this together, we wanted to show uh, the states that had opted in to the AT&T built FirstNet system. Um, and as of December 28, 100% of all states have, have opted in. So that means that this is truly a nationwide initiative. You may see some states farther down the road decide they don't want to opt in. I don't think so. I think that this is the most economic way to build out a nationwide network. I said before, in building coverage is not part of the contract that AT&T signed. They have recognized and are starting to talk about what they're going to do to incorporate first net coverage into uh, stadiums, uh, major buildings like convention centers and that. For smaller and medium-sized venues, it will be up to the venue owner to supply first net recovery. First net coverage. And we have a question came in as to who usually pays for the system. For smaller and medium sized venues, it will be up to the venue owner. It means that the venue owner is going to be the one that's paying for uh, this first net coverage system. And I, I cannot see any other way around it. Most of the buildings aren't big enough to make a, a commercial argument to the operators or to first net. And then the last thing is, we're going to deploy FirstNet. It's absolutely going to come, but expect two systems to run in parallel, whatever they're using now, plus the new FirstNet system. So this is the future that's happening this year, and it will roll out over the next several years. But this is something that you need to be aware of for a building, that in addition to your existing uh, First responder coverage, you need to see what they're thinking about with FirstNet and when they're going to need it. Okay? Hi, Gary. We have another Just question. Quickly. Okay, it's a good question. I'm not sure what you mean by confidence testing, but yes, public safety systems um, go through, first of all, the existing, you know, the standards that we have, um, APCO, um, the, you know, uh, fire standards, we have to go through and meet those systems. So that is important as well. But typically what happens is that your first responder will ver verify coverage within the building. If it's a relatively small building, and my relatively small is a fairly large building, they will likely do that by going through the building and making sure that they are getting adequate signal throughout the building. In larger venues, you will actually do a test, and some of those tests get fairly complicated. The most critical one I've seen required us to do a, uh, a verification of a uh, signal coverage in an area that was, I think, about three by three, um, three feet by three feet. So it was, it was basically a square, every square yard you had to verify that you had adequate coverage. Um, I believe that was overkill, but that was a requirement to verify it. The other thing you're going to see is if you've got any redundancy, you have to verify that that redundancy system works as planned. Um, so that's part of the, the verification of it to making sure that, that it works properly. And then the other thing I, I believe is going to happen is that you will have an annual fire inspection and they will verify the alarms. They will verify that the system operates and still provides adequate coverage. They will verify that any redundancy features built into the system still work. And whether that's done directly by the fire department or whether it's done as a, you know, a, a verified report that you submit. But I believe that's the other thing that we're going to see more and more. Um, 
So is it in place? There's another question here. Is, is this in place uh, by law locally for Seattle or nationally? It's not in place nationally. There's no national standard right now. Um, but there are a couple of standards, uh, NFPA and IFC, the two we mentioned. There are a couple of standards that are really interesting because if I put the two of them together, they cover every state. But most states are one or the other. So I think what we're going to see is, is again, with, with FirstNet, if you look at the requirements imposed on AT&T by the contract for coverage, those will probably transfer in some way or form to in-building. And once those transfer to in-building systems, we're probably going to see the emergence of a national standard. It's not there yet but it's coming. So I hope that answers that question. And okay, so Gary, I, I'm gonna jump in here on also, um, gonna try to answer some of these questions and gonna do name dropping. Last year in Seattle, we did a small uh, conference with BOMA on in building wireless technology. And there were uh, public safety officials from city of Seattle attended. And their name was uh, Charles uh, Cordova. Uh, Christopher Lombard and uh, Spencer Painter. And it sounds like they were very uh, uh, open uh, and uh, easy to get a hold of people. And uh, they are good resources for you to check locally uh, to see some of these first net and in, in building public safety requirements. On the testing side, um, there's a thing called benchmark testing. Basically, you use mobile device and scanners and, and collect RF data prior to deploying any kind of wireless systems. And for those kind of services, you can reach out to both Daspedia as well as the Dali Wireless and we can help you to assist with those as well. And if you need the local officials contact information, you can reach out to Daspedia after this. And our email is info at daspedia.com and we will co uh, connect you to the right people. And also Gary is a good resource for that as well. Okay. Okay, thank you. And just to answer the, the, the question, um, uh, the, the question was, um, when will the FirstNet initiative be required by law to be in place? Uh, it will not be required by law to be in place, as far as I know. What it is, is the establish the network AT&T is going to build it out. That's a federal initiative. There will be federal money available to any state or local agency that wants to convert to FirstNet. The expectation is that the move will be made for economic reasons, not necessarily um, because the system is new. How does it affect the existing buildings? Right now, this does not apply to existing buildings. The only way that it comes into play in existing buildings is if you do a major renovation, you have to get a new occupancy permit, then current law comes into place. And as far as I know, there are no grandfathering clause, clauses in place yet. So this is still a, um, a stick in a carrot if you want. The federal government established the requirements, wrote the spec, AT&T was a successful bidder on building it out across the country on a macro basis. And then the federal government has funds available to encourage the individual states to migrate to the system. But it is nothing here has, has yet been said that you have to do this. And I doubt if, if the federal government would impose that type of requirement. Okay, do you wanna to go to the next one? Wendy, I want to leave a little bit of time for questions. Um, okay, so just to conclude, there's more widespread stringent re regulatory requirements for first responding in building systems. Uh, those requirements are nationwide, but they're not standardized nationwide. We've done an overview of the evolution of public safety systems and beyond P25 leading to FirstNet, and FirstNet is a reality. I mean, it, it is being built out now. I am getting questions about uh, how does DAS affect some of the features uh, that are inherent in FirstNet. 
what we can do to provide a, a system in building that will enable FirstNet. We have actually designed systems with FirstNet capability in them, even though it hasn't been turned on yet. So FirstNet's a reality. And then again, with all of the considerations that we've talked about, you need to look at a cost-effective, future-proof solution. Uh, Sayola mentioned that certainly Daspeedy is a good resource. Uh, you can always get a hold of me directly. Uh, I think the next slide has our email contact information, Wendy. Yeah, so you can always get a hold of either uh, Wendy or myself, and we will be happy to answer any questions. Uh, but hopefully this has given you an overview of what we're talking about. Um, and again, um, just to, one more question, uh, in, in, and this is from Bryce, that is the testing performed on an end going annual quarterly basis, not just on install? The testing right now is on install, but for most public safety systems, if they're mandated by the local fire department, there will be an annual fire department inspection as well. And that's what I expect to take place. For very large systems when we build them, those systems also include uh, ongoing maintenance contracts. And those maintenance contracts usually include an annual review as well. And then they have one last question, what are the steps for implementing a system? Again, we're getting to the point where things are, are complicated enough that as early on in the process of a new building as you can, um, get involved in seeing what's out there uh, in terms of RF, what you need, what you expect to put in the building in both commercial and public safety systems, and contact your, your local public safety officials because they will be very helpful in defining what you need to do. At that point, you can start designing a system, looking at the cost, see what meets your requirements. And if, again, with a new building, you're going to be putting it in as, as the building construction takes place. It can save you a considerable amount of money. It should be ready to go once the building is finished and ready for occupancy. All right. So I'm going to add there uh, also um, for public safety systems, uh, for one of the uh, first steps be uh, to contact your local uh, fire marshal. This case, um, uh, again, the name was Charles Cordor. He was a nice gentleman who was very reachable. And he had all the information about as far as the building requirements go. He's with the Seattle Fire Department. And you can reach out to him and ask if the most likely if it's a new building or after major renovation for public safety systems, then you'll be required to probably required to have some sort of public safety systems if you are, you know, building above 50,000 uh, square foot. Uh, somewhere around that uh, there. Now on the commercial side, uh, that requirement, there's really no requirement, but usually the tenants are the ones who start demanding for that uh, uh, coverage, right? Before, the, uh, when they start renewing the lease because the, everybody's cutting cords, everybody's uh, implementing, bring your own device uh, kind of policy in terms of the cellular coverage. So everybody, uh, let's say if the, uh, the venue has occupancy of you know 10 20 different companies in each company employ 100 or so people in their people are you know have a variety of different uh, carriers and so uh, they will demand from the uh, uh, landlords to have adequate coverage for each one of those uh, carriers so one of the first step you do is once you have that requ uh, requirement from your tenants then you do uh, benchmark testing you collect rf data in your building go around with the uh, scanners and make sure there is enough coverage for each carriers. Once you collect the data, then you analyze and decide what type of solutions are right for you. And for those kind of services, again, you can reach out to us and 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 uh, that's PDA directly, as well as the Gary and and for public safety portion, uh, and uh, talk to us as well.
So we wait, we're going to uh, wait for a couple more minutes for additional questions. If there's no questions, I'm just going to go over <coughs> the, the certificates for um, uh, clock hours. Uh, you can reach out to Wendy Har. Just send her a direct email. Her email show, is shown on the screen. And she's going to provide you with a copy of the certificate. Uh, um, and uh, you can submit that whoever that needs to be submitted to claim your uh, clock hours again. Thank you for attending our online training. We hope to do an, another one in a few months, so please participate. If you need the individual or group training on any public safety or commercial wireless technology, then again, reach out to us to daspedia.com. Okay, thank you. This concludes our online training and uh, talk to you folks later. Thank you.